Well, my good friend Professor Ye said yesterday this was the panel of the big potatoes, so we'll start with one that's half baked, and then uh, shall we move on to some very well cooked potatoes? Um, I've written this BCAS working paper, which is enormous because the topic is very enormous. It's a survey, even a selective survey, of food regime analysis. And there's no way I can attempt to summarise it here. So I'm going to um, move towards debates about a current third regime, a uh, current third food regime, the so-called corporate food regime, which is a big preoccupation today. Um, but first I'm just going to show my summaries of the first two food regimes which were formulated in an extremely important, innovative paper by Harriet Friedman and Philip McMichael um, uh, 25 years ago. And um, why am I showing these slides of the earlier food regimes? Well, basically to demonstrate that I have actually done the work, I suppose. Um, so the first, well, let me just tell you what, how they describe food regimes, because I think it's important. And also because, like a lot of innovative work, what they did has now become so much part of what we do um, that we may forget its origins, we may forget uh, their contributions. Um, so in their original article in 1989, they said that their aim was to explore the role of agriculture in the development of the capitalist world economy and in the trajectory of the state system to provide a world historical perspective. They use that term. And the notion of food regimes that they offer this links international relations of food production and consumption to forms of accumulation, broadly distinguishing periods of capitalist accumulation. And at that time, in the late 80s, they identified two such global food regimes. So the first one was from 1870 to 1914. And the more important thing about this table and the other tables I'm going to show is not that you can immediately grasp all the detail, but to show in that left-hand column what kinds of determinations that they, they focused on, what they saw as the most important factors that shape and drive food regimes. So, first of all, the international state system. Secondly, dominant forms of capital, which obviously is a preoccupation, as we saw yesterday. Third, international divisions of labor and trade in agricultural commodities. Fourth, something that was much emphasized in subsequent work by Harriet Friedman, which is the rules or legitimating discourses of uh, different food regimes. Then another a fifth dimension or element, which again uh, was emphasized later than in the original article, which is what are other social forces involved in the functioning and indeed tensions and possible crises and uh, demise of food regimes. Um, and I put European working classes and family farmers in settler states here with a question mark because they are mentioned but in my view they're not really explored. Then technical and environmental change which was there from the beginning but became increasingly important of course, today with political ecology and very, very strong ecological theses being asserted in food regime analysis. And then finally, tensions and contradictions in food regimes that help bring them down and create the conditions for a new food regime to emerge. Also a question mark here because I don't think they really explained what the contradictions of the first food regime were and why they led to a second food regime. I mean, if you look at the date, the end date of the first regime, 1914, then the first food regime in their account came down in the general crisis and collapse of 
world capitalism that led to the, the First World War. Okay, the second food regime, um, which was elaborated in very important ways later on by Harriet Friedman. I couldn't get all this on one slide, as you can see. In fact, as we move from first to second to third food regime, the stories become more complex, more elements are, uh, are highlighted. But we've got international state system there. Again, dominant forms of capital, international division of labor and trade, particularly in the context of... Particularly in the context of decolonization in Asia and Africa and uh, superpower rivalry between the, the American and, and Soviet blocs. Half baked. Uh, as I say, I can't uh, begin to uh, elucidate or elaborate these here. Rules, legitimation, uh, food aid, American food. can do this without the microphone. <laughs> um, having spent many years at SARS lecturing to groups of 200 master's students, I think I can manage. Tell me if, if you can't hear me or uh, if it's not clear. Um, the pivot, to use one of their key metaphoric terms of the second food regime, was American food aid, both in terms of what changed in uh, American agriculture and the emergence of agribusiness and its regulation, then replicated in Europe, post-war reconstruction and so on, and then in terms of instituting third world food dependence, which to them was one of the primary effects of the, uh, of the second food regime. Social forces, again, not really much there in accounts of the second food regime, Although retrospectively, Harriet Friedman says environmental and other social movements started to emerge in spaces in the second food regime and became much more important subsequently uh, in the third food regime. Technical environmental change, very interesting. I mean, I think the question of how agriculture is industrialized, the different aspects of agriculture and so on, remains very important to this day. There were tensions and contradictions in the second food regime between, especially between what Harriet Friedman called its mercantilist and industrial elements. Mercantilist refers to the, the trade rules, uh, the use of food aid in American foreign policy and so on. And industrial refers to the, the growing um, power and range of what agribusiness corporations were doing, to the point where they started to find the mercantilist framework was restricting them. So that was very much a tension or a contradiction within the sphere of capital. And then alternatives, we begin to see uh, arguments for the localization of food production and distribution, this is a theme that, of course, has come center stage today with, with food sovereignty ideas and Harriet Freeman's pleas for democratic food policy. Okay, so a third food regime now. Um, and again, let me just go through this quickly with the international state system. Dominant forms of capital now, especially financialized capital going into agriculture, which we heard about yesterday in very illuminating ways, I think, financialization of corporate agribusiness capital, international divisions of labor and trade, partly continuing certain aspects of the second food regime, but, um, but now also new, new forms of, uh, of investment, land-grabbing debate, and so on. 
rules and legitimation. Well, I think two key things here is, of course, the generalized ideology of neoliberalism and continuing and updated ideologies of agricultural modernization uh, that, that suit the, uh, the activities of uh, corporate agribusiness very well. There's this notion of the westernization of diets. I actually think that is much more tricky in some ways. I mean, for example, we know that consumption of meat is um, rising extremely fast in China and that this has all sorts of issues, including for imports of soy and other uh, uh, grains that are used for animal feeds. And um, some young Chinese scholars I know refer to this as the Western westernization of diets. Well, all I can say is I'm not sure why eating more meat is necessarily falling uh, prey to, to Western cultural imperialism and also the way they cook the meat in China is fantastic. <laughs> there are many great ways of cooking meat that don't taste at all to me like what one might eat in the West. Um, social forces. This is absolutely crucial because when it comes to a third food regime, there is a certain parting of the ways between its original authors, Harriet Friedman and Philip McMichael. Harriet Friedman has a much more tentative view about a third food regime. Philip McMichael has a very, very strong, expanded set of claims about uh, the corporate third food regime. Something that interests me, and I don't know the answer, but it may have occurred to you in other contexts, is I'm not sure whether political differences between Harriet Phil McMichael stem from their intellectual differences or they have political differences which their intellectual arguments then serve. You know, which, which, which way around does this work? But Harriet is much more tentative about the third food regime and she favours politically what she calls a builder approach. That she looks for movements, organisations which are creating spaces of food production, distribution, consumption and so on, alternative to uh, the powers of corporate agribusiness. And this partly comes from her own activity as, as an activist, her own experience as an activist in the Toronto Food Council. Um, so she, uh, she favours what she calls the builder approach as distinct from the warrior approach. And Phil McMichael is very much the warrior approach. Um, and he sees La Via Campesina and similar movements as the absolute antithesis of the corporate food regime and as a world historical force that shows, shows us the future or a possible future that is infinitely better uh, than what, uh, what we have today. It's going to, it's, it's going to bring in... Uh, agroecology, ecological wisdom, social justice, and so on. So he takes this very, very strong position. And there is a curiosity here, in my view, which is that classic food regime analysis, the first and second food regimes, peasantries were, are completely missing, actually. It's very focused on, you know, the, 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 the countries of the north, and it's above all the USA. And, um, and, and indeed, the, the, their accounts of the first two food regimes are both very capital-centric and very state-centric. But now, as it were, Philip McMichael has discovered the world's peasantry, or more generically, small farmers, through the medium of La Via Campesina, and so he sees in them... Uh, uh, the, the definitive struggle of, of our times. This is the terrain of the definitive struggle against neoliberal capitalism and its globalization for Philip McMichael. And this leads, and I consider this in some detail in the last part of my paper, this leads to what I think is a, a kind of peculiar dialectic, 
to, to use a term introduced by uh, Sergio Sauer yesterday, a perverse dialectic between expansion of the claims of food regime analysis and in ways that I think are sometimes not very helpful because they tend to portray corporate agribusiness as this giant steamroller that is going to destroy the world and destroy all of us unless it is successfully countered, combated by agroecology uh, via, via Campesina and so on. And, I th I, and so that's an expansion. But I think there is a cost to this which is a contraction of the explanatory powers of food regime analysis because it has now reached a point, certainly in the McMichael approach, where, we, where there is a relatively simple binary. So it's not actually a contradiction of thesis, antithesis leading to synthesis, it's just thesis and antithesis. So it, it, I think it's more static than we would, we would like it to be. So one of the expressions of that is that um, material evidence is compiled just to prove, to verify, to demonstrate the two sides of that uh, binary, that corporate capital is vicious and small farmers are virtuous. And I explain a number of ways in which this is done. There's a tremendous principle of selection here. There's all kinds of important literature that is left out because it doesn't fit uh, neatly enough into this binary and, and how it's constructed. So we have this perverse dialectic or simply perhaps just a paradox, not unknown in the social sciences, of kind of tremendous inflation on one hand, expansion of claims. Everything that happens in the world today almost can be attributed to the machinations of corporate capital. And then on the other hand, uh, proof, proof in inverted commas, of the virtues of small-scale farming, um, which proceeds mostly through what I've called emblematic instances. Um, this small group of uh, so-called peasant farmers in southern India or southern Africa or, 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 or Central America show that they can feed themselves um, uh, by, by agroecological means. And in my view, and I've written about this at greater length in my sceptical paper on food sovereignty, published in the Journal of Peasant Studies, uh, in the best circumstances, perhaps some of these communities of small agroecological farmers can feed themselves and feed themselves better um, than they could, they could eat by buying their food in supermarkets, to, to use an example that came up yesterday. Um, but they're not going to feed the rest of the world. So that, in very crudely, is, is a, a sort of summary of the argument. And I'm just going to take two minutes more, <laughs> so he will let me, um, to see if the potato gets a bit more baked. One is um, the question of population, which I've mentioned in other writings. I mean, it's extraordinary to me that there is no demography in the food regime analysis. It covers a period in which world population has increased, I don't know, maybe six or seven times, and that world population has been able to eat. Now, this is not to ignore, of course, the massive inequalities in distribution, a very important issue that, that Andres was raising yesterday, but those inequalities do not come from there not being enough food being produced in the world, they come from the inequalities of of capitalism and the class distribution of income. Um, so that's, that's um, one important point. The other thing I try to do in the paper is to say I hope that the advances that have been made by food regime analysis, that we do now think internationally about food questions, as we saw yesterday, that the advances have been, that have been made shouldn't be made at the sacrifice of more classic agrarian questions, but we must find ways of integrating them. That there are dynamics of class formation uh, in the countryside and issues of, of, of reproduction in the countryside that cannot be attributed solely to 
what's happening in the global world of corporate agribusiness and so on. And it seems to me we had a very, very good example of the continuing salience and significance of classic agrarian questions yesterday in um, Jing Zhongye's presentation uh, about China, uh, which preceded, and in my view, rightly, almost without any reference to what's happening uh, in, in, in agriculture um, globally. And I'm going to finish now by putting in an advertisement which, which Ye uh, failed to do yesterday, which is that he, together with Forrest Jang and Carlos Oya, have edited a really, I think, important special issue of the Journal of Agrarian Change on uh, agrarian change in China today, which will be out um, this year. It will be out in um, a matter of months. So please look out for that. And in the pages of that, some of the contributors do pursue further this line of discussion that I've just introduced of issues of the relations between looking at capitalism globally, as food regime analysis does, and looking at classic questions of class formation, class change in the countryside, albeit, of course, in new historical conditions today.